Chapter Three of the Tunnel Under the World by Frederick Pohl. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the morning of June sixteenth, Guy Burckhardt woke up in a cramped position, huddled under the hull of the boat in his basement, and raced upstairs to find it was June fifteenth. The first thing he had done was to make a frantic, hasty inspection of the boat hull, the faked cellar floor, the imitation stone. They were all as he had remembered them, all completely unbelievable. The kitchen was its placid, unexciting self. The electric clock was purring soberly around the dial. Almost six o'clock, it said. His wife would be waking at any moment. Burkhart flung open the front door and stared out into the quiet street. The morning paper was tossed carelessly against the steps, and as he retrieved it he noticed that this was the fifteenth day of June. But that was impossible. Yesterday was the fifteenth of June. It was not a date one would forget. It was quarterly tax return day. He went back into the hall and picked up the telephone. He dialed for weather information and got a well-modulated chant, "'And cooler some showers. Barometric pressure 30.04 rising. United States Weather Bureau forecast for June 15th, warm and sunny with high around.' He hung the phone up. June 15th. "'Holy heaven!' Burkhardt said prayerfully. "'Things were very odd indeed.' He heard the ring of his wife's alarm and bounded up the stairs. Mary Burkhart was sitting upright in bed, with the terrified, uncomprehending stare of someone just waking out of a nightmare. Oh! she gasped, as her husband came in the room. Darling, I just had the most terrible dream. It was like an explosion and— Again? Burkhart asked, not very sympathetically. Mary, something's funny. I knew there was something wrong all day yesterday, and— he went on to tell her about the copper box that was the cellar, and the odd mock-up someone had made of his boat. Mary looked astonished, then alarmed, then placatory, then uneasy. She said, "'Dear, are you sure? Because I was cleaning that old trunk out just last week, and I didn't notice anything.' "'Positive,' said Guy Burkhart. I dragged it over to the wall to step on it to put a new fuse in after we blew the lights out, and after we what? Mary was looking more than merely alarmed. After we blew the lights out. You know, when the switch at the head of the stair stuck. I went down to the cellar and— Mary sat up in bed. Guy, the switch didn't stick. I turned out the lights myself last night. Burkhart glared at his wife. Now I know you didn't. Come here and take a look. He stalked out to the landing and dramatically pointed to the bath switch, the one that he had unscrewed and left hanging the night before. Only it wasn't. It was as it had always been. Unbelieving, Burkhart pressed it and the light sprang up in both halls. Mary, looking pale and worried, left him to go down to the kitchen and start breakfast. Burkhart stood staring at the switch for a long time. His mental processes were gone beyond the point of disbelief and shock. They simply were not functioning. He shaved and dressed and ate his breakfast in a state of numb introspection. Mary didn't disturb him. She was apprehensive and soothing. She kissed him goodbye as he hurried out to the bus without another word. Miss Mitkin, at the reception desk, greeted him with a yawn. "'Morning,' she said drowsily. "'Mr. Barth won't be in today.' Burkhart started to say something, but checked himself. She would not know that Barth hadn't been in yesterday either, because she was tearing a June fourteenth pad off her calendar to make way for the new June fifteenth sheet. He staggered to his own desk and stared unseeingly at the morning's mail. It had not even been opened yet, but he knew that the factory distributor's envelope contained an order for twenty thousand feet of the new acoustic tile, and the one from Feinbeck and Sons was a complaint. After a long while he forced himself to open them. 
They were. By lunchtime, driven by a desperate sense of urgency, Burkhart made Miss Mitkin take her lunch hour first. The June 15th that was yesterday, he had gone first. She went, looking vaguely worried about his strained insistence, but it made no difference to Burkhart's mood. The phone rang, and Burkhart picked it up abstractedly. Contro Chemicals Downtown, Burkhart speaking. The voice said, This is Swanson, and stopped. Burkhart waited expectantly, but that was all. He said, Hello? Again the pause. Then Swanson added in sad resignation, Still nothing, eh? Nothing what? Swanson, is there something you want? You came up to me yesterday and went through this routine. You— The voice crackled. Burkhart! Oh, my good heavens! You remembered! Stay right there. I'll be down in half an hour. What's this all about? Never mind, the little man said exultantly. Tell you about it when I see you. Don't say any more over the phone. Somebody may be listening. Just wait there. Say, hold on a minute. Will you be alone in the office? Well, no, Miss Mitkin will probably— Hell, look, Burkhart, where do you eat lunch? Is it good and noisy? Why, I suppose so. The Crystal Cafe. It's just about a block. I know where it is. Meet you in half an hour. And the receiver clicked. The Crystal Cafe was no longer painted red, but the temperature was still up, and they had added piped-in music interspersed with commercials. The advertisements were for Frosty Flip, Marlin Cigarettes, They're Sanitized, the announcer purred, and something called Choco Bite Candy Bars that Burkhart couldn't remember ever having heard of before. But he heard more about them quickly enough. While he was waiting for Swanson to show up, a girl in the cellophane skirt of a nightclub cigarette vendor came through the restaurant with a tray of tiny, scarlet-wrapped candies. Choco bites are tangy, she was murmuring as she came close to his table. Choco bites are tangier than tangy. Burkhart, intent on watching for the strange little man who had phoned him, paid little attention. But as she scattered a handful of the confections over the table next to his, smiling at the occupants, he caught a glimpse of her and turned to stare. Why, Miss Horn, he said. The girl dropped her tray of candies. Burkhart rose, concerned over the girl. Is something wrong? But she fled. The manager of the restaurant was staring suspiciously at Burkhart, who sank back to his seat and tried to look inconspicuous. He hadn't insulted the girl. Maybe she was just a very strictly reared young lady, he thought, in spite of the long bare legs under the cellophane skirt and when he addressed her she thought he was a masher. Ridiculous idea! Burkhart scowled uneasily and picked up his menu. Burkhart! It was a shrill whisper. Burkhart looked up over the top of his menu, startled. In the seat across from him the little man named Swanson was sitting, tensely poised. Burkhart! The little man whispered again. Let's get out of here. They're on to you now. If you want to stay alive, come on!" There was no arguing with the man. Burkhart gave the hovering manager a sick, apologetic smile, and followed Swanson out. The little man seemed to know where he was going. In the street he clutched Burkhart by the elbow and hurried him off down the block. "'Did you see her?' he demanded. "'That horn woman in the phone booth. She'll have them here in five minutes, believe me, so hurry it up.' Although the street was full of people and cars, nobody was paying any attention to Burkhart and Swanson. The air had a nip in it, more like October than June, Burkhart thought, in spite of the weather bureau. And he felt like a fool, following this mad little man down the street, running away from some them, toward, toward what? The little man might be crazy, but he was afraid, and the fear was infectious. "'In here!' panted the little man. It was another restaurant, more of a bar, really, and a sort of second-rate place that Burkhart had never patronized. "'Right straight through,' Swanson whispered, 
and Burckhardt, like a biddable boy, side-stepped through the mass of tables to the far end of the restaurant. It was L-shaped, with a front on two streets at right angles to each other. They came out on the side street, Swanson staring coldly back at the question-looking cashier, and crossed to the opposite sidewalk. They were under the marquee of a movie theater. Swanson's expression began to relax. "'Lost them!' he crowed softly. "'We're almost there!' He stepped up to the window and bought two tickets. Burkhart trailed him into the theater. It was a weekday matinee, and the place was almost empty. From the screen came sounds of gunfire and horses' hoofs. A solitary usher, leaning against a bright brass rail, looked briefly at them and went back to staring boredly at the picture as Swanson led Burkhart down a flight of carpeted marble steps. They were in the lounge, and it was empty. There was a door for men and one for ladies, and there was a third door marked Manager in gold letters. Swanson listened at the door and gently opened it and peered inside. Okay, he said, gesturing. Burkhart followed him through an empty office to another door, a closet probably because it was unmarked. But it was no closet. Swanson opened it warily, looked inside, then motioned Burkhart to follow. It was a tunnel, metal-walled, brightly lit. Empty, it stretched vacantly away in both directions from them. Burkhart looked wondering around. One thing he knew, and knew full well, no such tunnel belonged under Tylerton. There was a room off the tunnel, with chairs and a desk, and what looked like television screens. Swanson slumped in a chair, panting. We're all right for a while here, he wheezed. They don't come here much any more. If they do, we'll hear them and we can hide. Who? demanded Burkhart. The little man said, Martians. His voice cracked on the word, and the life seemed to go out of him. In morose tones he went on. Well, I think they're Martians. Although you could be right, you know. I've had plenty of time to think it over these last few weeks, after they got you. And it's possible they're Russians, after all. Still, start from the beginning. Who got me when? Swanson sighed. So we have to go through the whole thing again. All right. It was about two months ago that you banged on my door late at night. You were all beat up, scared silly. You begged me to help you. I did? Naturally, you don't remember any of this. Listen, and you'll understand. You were talking a blue streak about being captured and threatened, and your wife being dead and coming back to life, and all kinds of mixed-up nonsense. I thought you were crazy. But, well... I've always had a lot of respect for you, and you begged me to hide you, and I have this dark room, you know. It locks from the inside only. I put the lock on myself. So we went in there, just to humor you, and along about midnight, which was only fifteen or twenty minutes after, we passed out. Passed out? Swanson nodded. Both of us. It was like being hit with a sandbag. Look. Didn't that happen to you again last night? I guess it did. Burkhart shook his head uncertainly. Sure. And then all of a sudden we were awake again. And you said you were going to show me something funny. And we went out and bought a paper. And the date on it was June 15th. June 15th? But that's today. I mean, you got it, friend. It's always today. It took time to penetrate. Burkhart said wonderingly, You've hidden out in that dark room for how many weeks? How can I tell? Four or five, maybe. I lost count. And every day the same, always the 15th of June. Always my landlady, Mrs. Kiefer, is sweeping the front steps. Always the same headline in the papers at the corner. It gets monotonous, friend. 
End of chapter 3